Hello again, as you may or may not know, I'm Alex, and this time I'm here to present the findings of my master's dissertation. Now, more specifically, the dissertation was a result, uh, or the dissertation was a collaborative effort between the University of Edinburgh and the Registers of Scotland, or ROS in short, in the sense that the Registers of Scotland gave me a scholarship and in exchange I worked on one of the projects for three to four months and wrote a dissertation about it. Now, to recap, the Registers of Scotland is the non-ministerial department of the Scottish Government responsible for the maintenance and compilation of legal documents concerning property in Scotland. On top of that, the Registers of Scotland celebrated its 400th anniversary in 2017, making it the oldest land registry in the entire world. Now, with so many years and um, with so many accumulated textual resources, the Registers of Scotland has a natural interest in finding new and interesting ways of processing these uh, textual resources, so to speak. And that's precisely the point where I and the, and the university come in. Now, at the Registers of Scotland, properties are normally associated with title sheets. So, title sheets are a representation, or title sheets are a legal document that represent rights of ownership. These title sheets are divided into several sections, out of which the A section is of particular interest to us within the context of this project. So, let me show you a um, more graphical representation of all of this to give you a clearer picture of what's going on here. A sections in general are accompanied by a map depicting several coloured entities. And these coloured entities are also present within the text in the form of colour style pairs. So edged red is uh, the boundary or the tenement, the tenement steading of the property in question. Tinted blue is the eastmost ground floor flat. Uh, tinted pink and tinted brown is um, the garden ground and store. And tinted yellow in this case is. Uh, uh, are the paths at the rear of the tenement. Now, um, these colours, it should be noted, do not only represent these physical entities in the real world, these colours, by the same token, also represent different types of ownership at a more abstract level. And uh, with this project, what ROS is inter interested in is uh, mapping these colour pairs to the corresponding types of ownership automatically. In uh, this particular um, instance, there are four types of ownership that are of interest to us. So there's uh, exclusive strata, exclusive solum, common strata, and common solum. So exclusive and common are very straightforward. So if something is exclusive, that means it is exclusively owned by the owner described in the title sheet. On the other hand, if something is common, it means that it is shared between different owners. Then you have solum and strata. So solum, that's an oversimplification, represents the ground upon which the tenement or upon which the uh, property is built, so to speak. Whereas strata represents a three-dimensional volume of space that can be on, above or below the ground. And that's particularly important when it comes to looking at flatted properties. Now the big challenge here is that there is no direct link between the colour pairs and their types of ownership. That information is hidden within the context and a person who's trained in Scottish legal terminology can actually read through the documents and that person might be able to or will be able to understand what the individual colours actually represent in terms of ownership. But if you take a computer for example a computer has absolutely no idea what any of this means or what any of this represents, let alone legal terminology in uh, Scotland, right? So we had to come up with a model that actually does allow the computer to learn these particular concepts. And we started with the conversion of words into some form of mathematical representation to allow the computer to pick up certain patterns or certain concepts within these uh, mathematical representations. And the model of choice that we used was the word to vec model, a um, model converting words into vectors that was developed by Google in 2012 or 2013. So what word to vec does is, as I said, it assigns vectors to all of the individual words. 
and uh, there are quite a few steps uh, to this particular process. So what you have to do first, you have to find all of the unique words within your text corpus, that's all of our A section, so to speak. And then once you have all of these uh, unique words, that's your vocabulary, you do the following thing. So here I made uh, an example with a text corpus consisting of only four words for the sake of argument. Now, every single word gets initially assigned a one hot vector that is the size of the vocabulary. So in this case, it should be of size four. And all of the elements within that vector are set to zero, except the one element denoting the position of that particular word that we're looking at in the vocabulary. So subjects has a vector of 1, 0, 0, 0, and within has a vector of 0, 1, 0, 0, and, and, so, for, and so on and so forth, basically. Of course, these are not the uh, vectors that we are going to use later. What we do with these is we take these vectors and we forward them through a one layer shallow neural network that is, that's being trained to predict the neighboring words of every individual word. And the training data that we're using here are the A sections themselves. So you look at the individual words in the A sections and then you look at the neighboring words of that current word and you train the neural network to predict the neighboring words with a certain degree of accuracy that is. And once you have accomplished this particular task, what you then do is you discard the output layer and you extract the hidden layer and from the hidden layer you extract the individual vectors for every single word, so in our case subjects within the land. Now what you have to do here is you have to imagine um, vocabulary that's not with, um, four words wide or large, you have to imagine the vocabulary of 10,000, 100,000, a million words here. But it should get the concept across to you basically. So now that we have the individual vector representation of uh, all of our words, what we have to do next is to come up with a model that learns the patterns between these words, so to speak, ownership patterns. And uh, in order to achieve this, it was proposed to use a neural binary classifier based on the LSTM architecture. LSTM stands for long short, long short term memory and is a type of neural network architecture that is designed to process sequences of data, vectors in our case, and at the same time also remember long term dependencies in that particular sequence. So LSTMs are quite complex, but uh, are other types of neural networks, for example recurrent neural networks that are also designed to process sequences, uh, normally suffer from the vanishing gradient problem. So what that means is when you have some information at the, at the beginning of a sequence, what you end up with is a slow dilution of that information over extended periods of time, and with A sections being 3, 400, 500 words vectors long, that certainly is a problem. Now the way LSTM, the, the way the LSTM architecture achieves this is through its gated structure. So not only does the LSTM cell, that's the individual neuron, look at uh, the current input and the previous input, it also uses a series of matrix multiplications to learn what's important to remember within the context of the classification uh, problem and it also learns what to discard in, within that particular task. And it achieves this by using the input gate, uh, the forget gate, as the name suggests it tells uh, the LCM cell what to forget and then the output gate. And all of these gates are essentially matrices of weights that are applied to the cell that then eventually gives you some form of output there. Okay, so now that we have established our model or our general approach, let's uh, look at it in more detail. We have to remember that our ultimate goal is the uh, mapping of the color pairs to their respective types of ownership, right? And unfortunately, you can't just simply go straight into the A sections and uh, look at the color pairs directly. You have to do a series of 
uh, sorting or pre-classification steps in order to be able to do that. Now, I would also like to mention at this point that this is a supervised learning problem. So in order to be able to train the classifiers that classify, let's say, a color as being common uh, solum or exclusive strata, you need to manually label a certain amount of A sections so that you have enough training data for the classifier. And uh, given the overall time period of three to four months, which is not a lot, uh, we kind of ran into the issue that we could not manually label a lot of documents. So we ended up with 200, um, 400 documents in total and 200 houses and 200 flats. And the reason why it took so long is basically that it took a week for me to learn the legal terminology that I needed to know to be able to do this. And then another one and a half weeks to actually annotate those 400 documents. And then time, as time is running, you still have to do your experiments and everything else that comes with it. But nonetheless, we got very good results later on, even with a limited amount of training data. All right, but as I said, we didn't look at the color pairs directly. We had a series of pre-classification steps. So what were these? So initially, we looked at an A section and we used an LSTM classifier to tell us whether the A section is a flat or a house. We previously manually labeled A sections being either flats or houses. And the reason why we did this is that houses have no strata to speak of. So they only have exclusive uh, solemn and common solemn and that's only two types of ownership. So separating these in the beginning makes sense in many ways. Now, once you've established what's a flat and what's a house, you then check if uh, the different ownerships actually exist within the piece of text. So what that means, when I say exist, that means that there is at least one or more color pairs within the text denoting the ownership in question that you're currently looking at. And once you've done that, then you actually go and look on, look into the A sections and you get the color pairs and then you assign the ownerships to the color pairs, so to speak. Now here, you might have a legitimate question. So why do you have to check if an ownership exists? Why don't you simply look at the color pairs straight away? And um, that we actually tried to do that and uh, I, can sadly say that that approach didn't quite succeed because there's a lot of uh, details and intricacies here that you have to watch out for. The details or a detailed explanation of uh, how we actually arrived at this particular approach are uh, written in my dissertation. I will put a link down into the description so if you have the time and energy you are certainly welcome to have a look at it. Okay, so now that we have established our overall model, or overall approach, let's look at some of the results that we have achieved, even with the limited amount of training data. So for classifying flats and houses, we use certain, we use different types of uh, architectures. We have a layer size of 30, layer size of 50, and a different number of layers. So one layer, two layers, three layers. Now obviously, as you can see, it doesn't really matter what layer architecture you choose, you always uh, you end up with similar results, but the results themselves are pretty promising. So you have accuracies of 90 plus percent, and uh, I would, can certainly argue, you can certainly put a strong argument here that if you had, let's say, a 4,000 or 40,000 labeled A sections instead of 400, you could push that number like, even further. Now, the results were a bit more mixed for the classifiers trying to detect ownership and for the classifiers looking at the individual colors and saying if that's common solemn or exclusive strata. But then again, here you have the sort of uh, problem or detail that you, you have multiple colors within an A section so that kind of skews your training data a bit and then certain uh, types of ownership are far occur far more often within the A sections and other types of ownership. So here we're trying to uh, identify existing types of ownership for uh, common strata, I believe. Yeah, common strata. 
and uh, as you can see like even with some tweaks so we did some upsampling we did uh, we copied some of the documents and then we randomly changed the color pairs to artificially generate more training data and as you can see like the accuracy or specificity and sensitivity is within the 80s and then you have a somewhat unstable training process now sensitivity and specificity in this particular context basically means that you have a binary classifier that either says ownership exists or ownership doesn't exist and uh, sensitivity is well ownership exists and specificity says ownership doesn't exist and specificity looks at the error yeah so you get the you get what I'm talking about if you're familiar with uh, machine learning in one way or the other and then again if you look at the colors exclusive strata being very common obviously means that it has more training data so we get we got very very good results when it came to detecting or when it came to assigning exclusive strata to the color pairs so the classifier that says color pair is exclusive strata or color pair is not exclusive strata had very good results so it was able in most cases to, uh, to say with almost 100 percent accuracy or specificity that is that, co that a particular color pair is not exclusive strata whereas uh, with, even with sensitivity you still have 90% so uh, in 90% of cases you were able to identify the color correctly as exclusive strata if it actually was exclusive strata so to speak. Now uh, with that I would like to kind of wrap this presentation up so there was a lot of information contained in there and you can see kind of the challenges and uh, the problems that you face when you're trying to implement machine learning in a real-world deployment scenario. Now this wasn't deployed obviously, this was a case study for the Registers of Scotland and a great opportunity for me to write a dissertation. But um, it actually shows you that uh, machine learning can be a viable path to solving real-world problems in a corporate environment. So it is up to ROS what they want to do with this dissertation. So they have valuable information telling them the advantages and disadvantages of this particular approach. And then they can take that going forward into the future, moving into the 2020s, so to speak. Right, and with that, I would like to end this presentation. Thank you for your attention, and I shall see you folks later.